had just, you know, earlier that year, as Adrian mentioned, May 2nd, 2011, I was elected the first member of Parliament. Woo -hoo! such as it was, was that I didn't have a hope in hell. And I remember being interviewed by a guest host on The Bill Good Show, definitely not Bill Good, from CKW, the week before the election. I don't know if any of you heard this. Yes. Yes? And he said, with all due respect, you couldn't be elected dog catcher. Oh. <laughs> she the due respect for it, didn't last. Because if each one of my amendments would have been accepted by the speaker as in order, 
had received a separate vote, which I believe they should have, we would have been voting for four days. Hmm. As it was, they compressed the votes, so we were only voting for 23 and a half hours straight. And I don't think anyone but me would have been willing to go through four days, so I felt like they would compromise. So sadly, at least what it proved was that Stephen Harper was prepared to submit a bill of 425 pages that fundamentally changed, deleted, repealed, destroyed 70 different laws. And that bill would go from first reading through second reading through committee, back at report stage, through passage to royal assent, without a single change of even the most minor uh, aspect. I mean, not a comma, not a semicolon, nothing. That's very unusual. I used to work in government, we used to approve, I mean, the point of parliamentary committees is to approve legislation. So I'm also watching since, of course, I've been there at exactly the period in which Stephen Harper has formed a false majority with a minority of the votes. He's got a majority of the seats. And it's absolutely appalling to watch legislation that we've had. Well, it was bad enough in C-38. Legislation that was passed under Brian Mulroney, like the Canadian Environmental Assessment, well, introduced under Brian Mulroney, passed under Jacques Pentier, was the Environmental Assessment Act. The Fisheries Act amendments of our habitat we've had since the 1960s. But this new bill, C-45, is savaging the Navigable Malarge Protection Act that we've had since 1882. And deciding, as you probably know, that navigable waters in Canada, unlike the definition we've had since 1882, that a piece of a body of water is navigable, if you can get a canoe or a kayak down it, the definition of navigable is now ever so much easier. You just look at the list at the back of the bill. So where Canada has millions of lakes, they're prepared to list 97 of them. And where we have tens of thousands of rivers, we now have a bill that lists 62 rivers. 62. One only for the Yukon. I mean, very few for me. So you look at this, you think, this is outrageous. So of course, I'm now preparing amendments on that. I love my job in the House of Commons. I love being able to raise issues before other people see them. And that's because I'm just there doing the work. People wonder, why, how come I read C-38 before anybody else? Because it's there and I have to work on it. Other MPs are, for, and this is not to put too much time on this, but I need to explain what's happening to Parliament, which is what's really happening to democracy, is that all the other parties control their MPs. Totally, all the time. All the other parties tell their MPs how they're going to vote every day, all the time, on every bill. Every day, the parliamentary pages who are wonderful young people attending the University of Ottawa, who get through a very competitive selection process, get to be pages in the House of Commons, one of their duties is to receive from the whip, something the Green Party will never have, actually, no whips, but every other party has a party whip, who hands out to the pages how that party is voting that day, and every piece of paper, they're not even told privately and have to hold it in their brains till they get out there to remember. Every single desk of every single MP, other than the two independents, and of course me, gets a piece of paper put on that desk. All the conservatives, all the NDP, all the liberals, and even the four remaining Bloc Quebecois MPs get the piece of paper that says, Today on the first vote, vote no. On the second vote, vote yes. On the third vote, no. Capital no. We. It's extraordinary to me. And uh, one day, as the pieces of paper were being handed out, one of my friends, I've made tons of friends. When I bring my daughter to Parliament, um, I find myself saying, oh, oh, I want you to meet another friend from work. And it doesn't matter if they're conservatives or liberals or you're Democrats or Bloc, they're my friends, and I really want my daughter to meet them. So one of my friends from work turned around and said to me, as he looked at his list of how he was supposed to vote that day. So listen, how do you know how to vote? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just one of those funny things I have to him. So they all know, and, they, and you know what? They wish they could do it too. That's the, the sad secret that's actually the hopeful secret of Canadian democracy. I would say from knowing my friends at work, that by far the vast majority, approaching 90% of them, 
would, in different circumstances, I be proud to have as Green Party candidates. They're all good people. They care about their communities. Their main inspiration to run for Parliament is to be of service. They believe that what they're doing is going to be a good thing for their country. And they don't learn the sad truth until they're elected. That they have no role, they have no voice, they have no brain. They're supposed to sit there and do what they're told and toe the party line. They're supposed to vote how they're told. God knows why any of them would ever read the legislation. Because if they read it, they might realize they had a different opinion than how they're told to vote. And that's why, I hate to say this out loud, but I don't think any of the other MPs read all the legislation. Or even most. Because why would you? Political party structures are there to tell people how to think, what to speak. They're handed the notes to tell them what to say. It's tragic because it's a squandering of the, you know, the goodwill and the good intentions of a bunch of really decent people who are being essentially held hostage by a system of hyper-partisan party politics run by a bunch of people who really don't differ very much from each other. And that group of people, I think there's you know, a clinical definition for them somewhere in the DSM, but they're the skin doctors. They may be sociopathic, they may be psychopathic, I'm not sure. They will never run for election. They will never put themselves out there. They live in the dark places. They use focus groups and polling and all kinds of strategy to figure out how to get to a victory, to win power. And what they want to do with that power once they get it isn't relevant to the people who are actually calling the shots. So every day in the House of Commons, the kinds of things that get raised by the other parties are not the things that are right in front of us as work. They're the things they think will get them on the news for a quick sound bite and a bump in the polls. It's why when I was trying to raise awareness of the fact that Stephen Harper had already signed in Vladivostok the Canada-China Investment Treaty, and we hadn't seen the text of it yet. And first I demanded to see the text. Then when we got the text, I found it worked on how to vote or a debate. And while this was to me the number one issue before Parliament, all the other opposition parties were fixated on one thing. Do you even remember now what the one big thing was? E. coli in the plant, the XLB plant. Now that's clearly an upsetting issue. <coughs> that's clearly a scandal. But it is not important compared to the Canada-China Investment Treaty. And I couldn't get any of the other parties to pay sufficient attention to decide that this was the issue we had to take on in the 21 city days when that was before the House of Commons. Now the 21 city days are up, and I'm still not prepared to give up on fighting the Canada-China Investment Treaty. It's not ratified yet. ratified yet is good news because legally, because it, it, you know, and it's not morally correct, and it's not even constitutionally correct, previous prime ministers would have always put a treaty of this importance in front of Parliament for a vote, even if it wasn't legally required. I mean, I actually had to go back to my, I'm glad I saved all my law books from law school. I actually went back to my constitutional logic book to check, and yes, a treaty of importance, even if it doesn't require implementing legislation, such as this one, even if it doesn't require a vote in Parliament, every other Prime Minister would have put it forward as a matter of course. In the same way that Jean Chrétien took the Kyoto Protocol, which was a treaty that did not require implementing legislation, it went to the House of Commons for a vote. This treaty, which will bind Canada for a minimum of 15 years, and then it's automatically renewed for another 15 years, unless Canada gives a one-year written notice that we want out of it, and at the point that we give the one-year written notice that we would get out of it, at the end of that one-year written notice, any existing Chinese investment in Canada is protected for a further 15 years under the trees. So to add that up, that's 31 years worth stuff. And that gives state-owned enterprises of China, like Sinopec, the fifth largest corporation on earth, which I would imagine is Stephen Harper's discomfort, is the number one purchaser of Iranian oil. Huh. And which has practices, I mean, you can imagine, this is, this is a country that, you know, you try to form a union, you end up in jail. This is not a place of, you know, they say, oh, human rights are improving in China. 
Well, Amnesty International doesn't think so. Human Rights Watch doesn't think so. The Tibetan monks who are self-immolating don't think so. What makes Stephen Harper think human rights have improved in China? Well, there's one reason. It turns out, which who knew this, if you're developing the oil sands and you have, as Stephen Harper does, a goal, believe it or not, a goal of six million barrels of oil a day, this is a goal I have never heard from any of the oil patch CEOs. This is a goal unique to Stephen Harper. He wants six million barrels of oil a day for the oil sands. They're currently at 1.7 million barrels of oil a day. And you know what? It must be hard for him because free market capitalism has let him down. Too many CEOs turn out to be weak-willed, yellow-livered, pussy-footing cowards because they start looking at market forces and say, like Suncor is saying now, Cabinet gave them approval for the Jocelyn Mine to expand in the oil sense. And Joe Oliver announced, we're giving the permit for the Jocelyn Mines, and it's terrible all those environmental reviews held up this mine. But we're approving the Jocelyn Mine. Suncor and its partner for the Jocelyn Mine, Total Lassay of France, are looking at market forces and looking at prices of oil and looking at the cost of expanding the oil sense. And they said, you know, we're going to go slow on that one. We're not interested.